Genevieve, I'm going to tra- turn it right on over to you and let you go ahead and start talking. Thanks so much for being here. Oh, it's my pleasure. Well, I think what everyone is tuning in for is the sort of the subheading of my the title I gave for this, um, which is Purpose, Passion, and Pajamas. It's transforming your life, embracing the human connection, and live living with meaning. And those are three of the major takeaways I have for the past 20 years of um, starting a nonprofit. And I'll tell you a little bit about that. And I'll weave in those three very important takeaways for me that I hope will mean something to you all listening. So I never thought I would start a nonprofit, never. I wanted to be Mary Tyler Moore. I wanted to climb the corporate ladder in New York City. Um, Was not exactly what my Italian parents, my dad off the boat thought for his first of four children who were raised in a very traditional Italian family. He wanted me, I think, to get married and have kids. And that just wasn't my, I didn't have that ticking clock. It wasn't my path. So it took a little while, but they learned to to understand that I really wanted to work out there in uh, the corporate world in Manhattan. So off I went and things were going great. I was climbing the corporate ladder in the entertainment business in New York for TV syndication, which is reruns basically. And I did that and I thought I had a great life. And I, I did, I did. I, I traveled and I got to have great um, bosses and learned a lot about marketing. And that was really my niche marketing. One day in the middle of a quiet afternoon by myself in my co-op, I heard a voice that came not from here, from here. And I know that we all hear voices and we know sometimes they are from here, but this felt different because it said to me and just to me inside, if this is the next 30 years, is this enough? And I was shocked. I sat down and I realized that the answer was no. I answered myself in the privacy of my own living room, and I said, I think I did miss something. Now, I was almost 38 years old, and for me, I was petrified, thinking, I've done all this. I thought everything was under control. I never thought about any other kind of a life, what, what's going on here. So I realized, thinking for the next literally hour, I missed having kids. I was going to be alone in 30 years. I had two brothers and a sister, a great you know, family, godson's niece, the whole bit. But there was something that was different, having that extended family and having your own. And while I didn't think, and I wasn't in a position, I wasn't even married, so I wasn't in any position in my traditional thinking to have a child of my own, I thought, how can I bring children into my life in a bigger way. And I thought, okay, I am working long crazy hours. I'll see if I can read to kids in shelters. And that's what I did. I called the police and you could do what I did. You could call at that time, 20 years ago, a shelter and say, hi, I'm a nice person. Can I come and read to the kids? And the answer was, you sound like a nice person. Sure, can't do that today. So off I went with some childhood books for bedtime reading. And I thought, okay, I'll go into the shelter and I'll sit with the kids and I'll read them a bedtime story, simple. And that's what I did. And I really had no idea what kind of lives these children had led. I read the newspapers. I saw the TV accounts of the worst case scenarios in my backyard of what's going on with some of these children. But here I was face to face, sitting on the floor in my corporate suit with these children, some crying, some disheveled, a lot of times, you know, barely able to pay attention because little did I know, learned later, some of the horrific things they'd been through. But I sat on the floor and I read those stories. Once a week, every couple of weeks. And once I watched after I read where they were taking them to go to sleep at night, And I followed the staff who were lovely, not a mom or dad, right? And I followed them and I saw them bring about a dozen kids to a room with futons 
and couches. And that was where they were going to stay. And they were safe because they hadn't been before. And they would be processed. And then I don't know what was the next step. So I realized they weren't changing into anything. And some of them had clothes that were soiled, didn't fit. And I watched this and I heard a couple of them sniffling, crying. And the only thing that came out of my mouth to the staff person, I whispered, can I bring some pajamas next week? And she said, oh, that'd be lovely. So a whole week, all I could think about was the pajamas, not the work I was doing, not my workaholic tendencies, not my next project or all the campaigns I was excited about a month before, but how many pajamas could I get? So I stuffed bags from all kinds of stores I shopped and I bought them in all different sizes because every week was different. I bought the pajamas. And after I read to this group of children, I told them I had a special surprise for them. And I started to give them a pair of pajamas each. And they were in a line. I asked them to stand in a line. And a little girl halfway through, she must have come up to my, my, my hip. And she just, I asked her, I, I said, these are for you, honey. And I tried to give her a pair of pink pajamas. And all she did was shake her head. And I didn't think she understood me. So I tried again because the other kids had taken them and gone with the staff to the, the room. And I tried again. I said, honey, these will fit you. And they're pink because you're wearing pink and purple. I think you like that. And she just shook her head again. And she wanted to watch me. So they didn't put her into the other room. They let her stand next to me. So she watched me give them to the rest of the kids. Finally, I turned again to see her. She was the last one. And their staff was standing now with her. And I knelt down and I tried again. I said, honey, don't you want the pajamas? They're going to fit you and they're going to be so soft. And she whispered to me, what are they? What are pajamas? And she couldn't even finish saying, pronouncing the word pajamas. And I took everything I could not to fall apart. I couldn't believe I heard what she said. She didn't know what pajamas were. And I explained, these are pajamas you can change. You can change now and look how soft. And the staff started to change her into them. And I said, what do you usually wear to sleep at night? She just tugged on her pants and she said, my pants. Well, that was the beginning of realizing that I had no meaning in my life. I had no purpose, that's for sure. And I was so ignorant of what I thought life should be. So everything shifted for me in that, in that moment. And all I could think about was that little girl. And that... I didn't know about purpose. You know, I thought purpose happens to famous people, to people who do magnificent things. You know, everyone from Einstein to the Dalai Lama um, to, to Oprah, who's got it figured out, right? I didn't realize at that time that all of us have a purpose, but we have to really be open to it and realize and think about it. And I didn't until that moment. So that was starting to hit home, that I had been living with, with no reason at all, except to make myself happy and to, to have things and to have friends and to have a great job. So what happened was I started to become obsessed with the situation. And we could call it passion. <laughs> there was, was obsession. But there was this amazing passion. Now, I had never been married. But through this struggle of my, my life the way it was, and this passion I had for all these children now, that connection that I had with that little girl in that instant when she looked at me and, and I looked at her, and then when she had the pajamas on and she was smiling looking at me and I was looking at her, I still feel that today. That connection was what I now call the human connection that is missing in our lives. That was so strong, so incredibly strong. I can feel it as I, as I speak now. That passion from that connection took, took over. And the universe has a strange way, and you've probably had lots of experiences too, of helping or bringing something to you just when you need it. Well, it introduced me to a wonderful man who I started to really care about. And he thought I was a career woman. So I had to break the news that I was now thinking about, to that, that time, I thought I was just gonna make a little shift. But 
I told him I'm thinking about changing from a career girl to some kind of a life handing out pajamas to kids. And um, he said, go for it. And he was the right guy at the right time. So he was right there as I made all these wrenching, gut wrenching decisions for switching my career down the line to part time uh, marketing jobs and things. And as I started bringing these pajamas around and then people, everybody I told the story to had that same human connection. It was as if when I was telling them the story, they were standing there with me in that shelter, looking at the girl. If they felt that in their heart, just what I felt. So the more I talked about it, the more people I told, the more human connections I made, the more I spread that passion, the more people wanted to help. And that was incredible, just incredible. And so many wonderful things happened along the way to bring us to a point where we have 63 chapters across the US, 7 million pajamas and books have been distributed and it's been, it's been incredible. So the transformation came from listening to what I can call my heart voice. We all have a heart voice and I'm sure that some of you listening are in nonprofit and definitely heard that and listened. And maybe some of you are reconsidering the path that you've been on. You don't have to jump off the corporate ladder like, like I did. I work with lots of people who want to just add their passion into their lives because you can't really stuff it down. You can't put it off. You can't say another time I will consider adding it's too busy now. And I understand that there are responsibilities and things and, and I didn't have children. So I get it when I hear people say, I can't make a financial sacrifice because my children are depending on this and you know our our finances are a certain way. And I get that. I, I promised my husband I would work at McDonald's and I came this close. Um, and I, I get that, but there's always a way to include you, include that nagging voice, that passion, that side, that the, the things you think about when you're not at work, or maybe the things you're thinking about when you are at work. There's a way to include that and make room and time because that's the most important part of your, your heart and your soul. That's what purpose is. And it, and it doesn't have to be full-time, but it has to have breath. And you have to share that because you will find other people will, will be attracted to what you're talking about, what you're doing. And you'll, you'll form another circle of friends or comrades or peers in that field. And that will fill you incredibly. I've seen it and I've talked to so many people who when they incorporate just a piece of what makes their heart sing, it makes an incredible, incredible difference. And in the same job, they're 100% happier because they have that voice. And that's the transformation. So there's always time, it's never too late. There's always a way to include what's missing in your life, in your life. I talk about embracing the human connection because there is nothing that could have brought us pajama program, my life, all those people that we've touched to the place where we are without all those connections face-to-face -face along the way. Yes, there's room for texting, there's room for emailing, there's room for social media, but every third or fourth phone call or email or text, make a date, see somebody in person. There's some power that's missing in any other kind of device that when you're sitting face to face, the eye to eye contact connects us heart to heart. It's amazing. It, it happens. You'll feel it. I'm sure you have. I'm sure you know the, the difference, but we're so busy and I'm guilty of this too. We are so busy that it's quicker to text or email or even make a phone call. 
but it's worth it, especially if it's something that you want to connect because you you need that understanding or you need to talk about a change or or any reason that you feel compelled to reach out to someone is stronger if you are face to face. It really stops the world almost and lets you for half an hour or an hour or more just be in that space and that connection, that invisible connection is so alive and so powerful that there's nothing that can replace that. And when I when I told the story from the early days, telling people about that little girl to today, nothing's changed about the impact of face-to-face -face when I tell that story. And the same is when I listen to other people's stories. I can feel them when they're standing in front of me, when they tell me anything, a story about their kids or about their husband, about what they did, fun, something funny that happened, something embarrassing that happened. It's 10 times more amplified face-to-face -face, and that sharing is incredible. So the human connection is, is, is very, very important and, and it's easier than we think. You know, when, when we're walking and we see a neighbor and we wave, stop. 10, 15, 20 seconds, if that's all you have, to look the person in the eye and just say, how's it going? What, you, what are you doing? Rather than just a wave as you pass or just say, how's it going? Fine, fine. Instead of making a date to go out for dinner, invite somebody to your home. Share the cooking and the cleaning and the laughing and the wine, that bonding. It's only going to happen when you're sharing something. And it's 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 really it's really intimate when you're cooking and cleaning together and not just waiting for the waiter to bring the food and take the plates. It's it's really different. Go into a store when you're shopping for someone, and instead of you know saying no thank you when the salesperson asks if you need anything. Say, you know what, I'm shopping for my mom, she has everything. Or I have a friend who is so difficult. You know, she has a dog, I don't know what to buy her. Engage them, you'll make their day. And it'll again, bring you into that present moment to share something. And all through the 20 years of JAMA program and now speaking and I'm writing a book, I'm sharing how different it is when you are sitting with someone face to face and heart to heart. And the third takeaway is all of this has taught me how vital it is, especially today, to live with meaning and lead with meaning. So many of us are leaders. Um, first, we're leaders in our, for our own lives, we're leaders in our lives. We are parents um, or grandparents, sisters, godparents, aunts. We're leaders in our personal life. And many of us are leaders in business. And it doesn't matter if you are a manager or you are a CEO. If you don't have that human connection with the people that you need, who need you to make a successful business, no one's going to care. They're not going to care just for a bottom line. All of us want to feel that we are contributing something that means something to us. I don't want to work for a boss because of his goals. He's not going to get anything. The leaders, the CEOs, and the bosses are not going to get anything by trying to impress upon their teams how important the goal is. It's not a one-way street. It has to be a connection. Everyone has to feel that they're contributing to a goal, to a space, to a culture that feeds each person. Or there will be no, no caring. There'll be no compassion. There'll be no understanding. There'll be no reason to go in every day to sit and feel isolated, to feel not connected, to feel like nobody's asking you. So. Those of us who are leaders and those of us who are on teams, 
need to break that impasse that so many of us are feeling these days in the certain climate that um, we're in right now. We have to break down the barriers and it can just start, just start with a conversation about what are your, what are your goals personally and working here. What can we each do to make sure we're living our, our lives with meaning and our, our, we're on purpose. And if it's something to do with the position here, a leader can ask, great. If not, tell me what you like to do. Tell me how we can make something happen here that will add to your, your purpose and make this a great place to come every day and, and encourage you to want to be part of our team because you do matter and you are seen and we are all getting to know each other. And we're building up that culture that's compassionate and caring and interested, genuinely interested in making the company the best it can be. So the living and the leading with meaning is, is so important today. And it really encompasses the, the passion, the purpose, the human connection, uh, maybe not always the pajamas, <laughs> For me, you know, it, it did because I found my purpose and I say, I found my pajamas and I try to help and encourage others to find your pajamas. So if there are any questions or any topics, uh, Randy, that um, you'd like me to touch upon or talk about? I'd love to. Sure. Uh, so everyone knows, anyone that uh, would like to ask uh, Genevieve a question, you uh, go over to your control panel and find the question box and type it in. And then I will say your words to Genevieve because our, our, you're all muted today. Uh, but but uh, we will uh, certainly get your words to her so that she can answer any questions. Thanks so much for your insight. That was really good. And I can just see your passion like <laughs> ooze through the webcam. It's <laughs> I tried to tame it. <laughs> you may have just satisfied everyone's questions. We'll wait oh, here just for another. Oh, here's one. Uh, Caitlin says, what suggestions do you have to discover your passion's meanings? If you, well, what I usually do with, with everyone is have them sit with me, paper and pen, and write down the first 10 things they love to do. This is several hours of exercises, but in a nutshell, write down the five to 10 things that you love to do. Don't think about it. Write down the first, first things that come to mind. Narrow it down now to three or four and look at each one that you've written. See which one makes you feel something. Some things might be heady. Maybe you want to learn French. Maybe you want to work with animals. Maybe you want to make a regular trip to a senior center. But look at what you've written down and pick the three or four that really pull at your your heart, because you have to feel it from here. You have to feel purpose from here. This is what you're doing during the day at work that uh, if you're an employee. This is what you're doing if you are a leader or a president or a CEO and you have a bottom line to worry about. That's here. I'm talking about here. Feel it here. Look at those three or four things that you've circled and go on with your day. It's gonna come back to you. See which ones come back to you and see what you're thinking about when they come back to you. And after that, go and sit down in a day or two and write out what you felt about those three or four. And now write out what you can do for one hour a week with each of those three or four to really give you some insight into, could I add this to my life? And if you keep narrowing it down, and I encourage anybody to write to me and we can have a full conversation. And my email is jen, G-E-N, at genevievepituro.com, which is my website, genevievepituro.com. And I can fully 
um, explore it with you. But that's where you start, the writing and the feeling. Does that help? All right. Um, here's another question that's connected to that. Do you have any daily habits that uh, are connected to hearing your heart voice? Yes, I meditate. Now, my husband teaches meditation. Um, and you can also email me if you want to hear about that. But there are lots of ways that you can you can meditate. When I and my husband taught me in the beginning, I never meditated. Um, he said, you know, it's part of asking the universe for help. I never asked the universe for help. Sit quietly, think about things, close your eyes, repeat something, sit still. I, I never sat still. So it wasn't easy at all, and, and I didn't believe it either. But meditation, any kind of meditation that you like, sit still for, now my husband says it takes, uh, I think he says five or six minutes for your brain to sort of get itself situated to quiet. It will take time though. You're, you're gonna have a million thoughts, but the meditation will start to work because you will give yourself permission to erase what's coming in for that time. That's your busyness and your negativity. And we all have those awful chirpy voices in our brain to really feel still. And then you start asking, I'm open to my purpose. I'm open to what I want and feel I want to do that's different, that I haven't maybe explored. And if you repeat that, I did that. I repeated that all during the day, different times in my meditation in the morning, but also in any downtime. And I heard when I was on the subway, I wasn't even meditating, but I was in that mode of saying, repeating, what is my purpose? I'm open to it. I'm open to it. You can say God, universe, higher self, whatever. I'm open to my purpose. That on a subway was when a raindrop feeling flopped in my head and the words pajama program came because all I was calling it was my pajama thing, giving out pajamas. It didn't have a name. And I kept saying, what am I supposed to do with this? Is this my purpose? I meditated, and then one day when I asked, plopped in my head. It's unexpected, but it it will happen. Long answer to a quick question. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Um, here's one. Uh, how can we help a, an employee who's uh, important to the organization but disgruntled and unapproachable? Uh, how do we help them feel the mission and his or her purpose? Um, well, I would say before you go, before you say um, anything about your purpose and the company's purpose, I think you need to give. I think you need to somehow engage them in what they're doing, uh, maybe find out what they like to do. Or if, if you don't feel that someone can, can ask, hey, what did you do this weekend? And sort of find some of their personal interests. But it starts with caring, reaching out. Not me, 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 but what's going on with you? What do you what do you like to do? You don't necessarily have to say, I understand that you're disgruntled. Can we talk about that? Because I don't know that that's going to open, give them a, a free space. But if you find out what's going on in their lives and you inter, you know, try to, to support and ask questions, everybody likes to talk about themselves, then I think they're more apt to feel that they can answer what they've been doing or talk a little bit about what they're doing because they'll feel that you didn't come in the room to say, what's going on with you? Why aren't you a team player? So I think, I think we have to engage the other people, the other person. And that's true in life. That's true in life. Nobody wants to go up and look at somebody and say, hey, let me tell you something. I, I wish you were more of this or that or what's going on without starting the conversation with, hey, I understand you got a new dog or, um, you know, I understand this or whatever and, and let them know you care. All right. Uh, do you have a one key quote spark question to help a person identify their passion? One keep one key. Well, I've heard a lot of people say, what would you do if money was no object 
you know, that that can be. I, I didn't ask myself that question, but of course it does work. What would you do if money was no object all day, you know? And as long as you're not answering sleeping, <laughs> I think there might be an answer there. Um, I My keys are more, my phrase, one of my phrases is, um, feel the fear and do it anyway, because that's what, <clears throat> excuse me, that's what most of us, that's what stops most of us from doing what we really want to do, making, make a change, singing, going to, to take some voice lessons, even if we want to just sing on for ourselves or in the community theater. It's so much of what we want to do is stopped by the fear and the fear is going to exist. So you have to, you have to just, you can't pretend it's not, and you can't wish it away. You just feel the fear and do it anyway. So that's, that's what I usually use as my barometers to why I'm not doing something or how I can summon up the courage to do something. I hope that helps. All right. Are you, do you have a book projects in the works, either an a, a adult or a, a picture book? I do. I have an adult book coming out and I'm going to make that announcement on social media and on my, in my newsletter in uh, within two weeks. Look at that. Did you have a plant in the audience? No, no, don't ask me. That's so funny. No, I, I, I thought I, I, I thought it was either just out or on its way out. So I, I just thought I'd give you an opportunity to talk about it. Oh, that's right. well, I can't yet, but I will soon. And, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, you heard you heard it here first, everyone. <laughs> Thank you so much, Genevieve. This has been so. I'm I'm ready to go take on my day. Um, I feel like I've I've done a lot of work on my heart voice, and I'm doing the things that I love to do. But but this is just so energizing, and I appreciate uh, you sharing this with our audience today. Oh, anytime, and I encourage anyone who wants to talk further or brainstorm or wants me to listen, I can I can listen well and just contact <laughs> me directly. And then go to her website and sign up so you know when her book comes out. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today. And until next time, go out and do good. Thank you, everyone.